it's a little difficult when we jump right into the Heidelberg Catechism at uh, the Christian Life, because of course that's section three. And uh, there's a temptation in the states, at least, to jump into section three right at the outset, uh, to skip over the, uh, the, 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 the guilt, uh, an analysis of what our problem is, what our plight is, so we don't quite know what the gospel is meant to answer. Uh, maybe it, it's to, to help us become better people, maybe it's to give us more sense of self esteem or happiness or joy in life, and certainly all of those things are byproducts of a, a walk with the Lord, but uh, is that the problem that I'm lonely? Is it the greatest problem that I face that I am uh, anxious, not about my, my eternal salvation, not about my relationship with God, but just anxious about life? And is it, is it the purpose of the gospel to provide therapy for me? in my daily struggle with a sense of meaninglessness. And so, uh, we, we, if we skip over guilt and go right to, to grace, then we don't really define grace the way the scriptures do, as an answer to a particular problem, the misery. Not just the personal, private misery that I experience, though that's certainly a part of it, but the miserable condition under which I live in my wretched state, under the wrath of God and under the tyranny of sin. And so the Catechism, uh, as we've already heard, addresses both of those concerns. And only then are we prepared to talk about gratitude. And I think it's important to, to see that these are not stages. Uh, it's, it, it's not as if, uh, you know, it would be a, a, a horrible thing for us to uh, catechize our kids with the first two years on guilt. And then the next two years on grace. And then the next five or ten years on gratitude. <laughs> uh, we don't go through these as stages, even as believers, as adult believers. Uh, we go through them as coordinates. In other words, they're always on our dashboard. We're always returning to guilt because we're Calvinists. <laughs> we're always returning to guilt, even as Christians, being driven to grace, to Christ and the gospel, and then living lives of gratitude. We're, we're, we're never, we're, we never grow out of the need to be brought back to our wretched condition, even as Christians, the gracious provision of the triune God in Jesus Christ and the need for us to show that gratitude in uh, holy living. So these are all coordinates that we're working with at all times as believers and not uh, simply stages that we go through. As we've heard, the, the, the Reformation note of pro me, for me, that was so much a part of the whole Reformation movement, Lutheran as well as Reformed, is very much at the heart of the Heidelberg Catechism. It's not just that these things are true, but why are they true? What difference does it make? So what is a great question Reformed people should always ask ourselves uh, whenever, we, whenever we teach. We should ask ourselves, so what? And that's how I think of some of those existential questions in the Heidelberg Catechism. Basically, good pastors, knowing that at a certain point you need to just ask, so what? What difference does it make? But the danger of starting with the Christian life is that we think that, not, that, we think that only those things that we can immediately see as relevant to our Christian life would have any importance for us. And so, for example, we don't hear much about the Trinity sometimes in Christian circles. It's an odd thing. Certainly, the Trinity is a central, uh, uh, not only central doctrine, but a, a central aspect of the, the life of the church in reform circles. Uh, and yet, you, you sometimes hear very little about the Trinity in broader Christian circles because 
uh, I don't see how it really affects my life. Wow, once you start really digging into the doctrine of the Trinity, you do see the relevance, but you have to bring the relevance out. You have to show how we pray in a Trinitarian way, how we worship in a Trinitarian way, how, how our lives are shaped by a life in Christ, before the Father, because of the Holy Spirit who is at work within us. And that's something that I have really come to appreciate about the Catechism and its treatment of the Christian life. Uh, it, it's like walking into a movie in the middle when we start with section 3. There's so much presupposed from sections 1 and 2 when we get to section 3. One more little introductory comment, and that concerns uh, piety, what piety meant. I don't need to tell those of you here... Uh, uh, who, are, who are gathered here for this, this event, that for the Reformers and for the Reformed tradition, generally, piety has encompassed both doctrine and life. Calvin considered the institutes of the Christian religion a sum of Christian piety. And tragically, these two things have gone their separate ways in uh, modernity. There has been a tendency to, uh, for some to take the doctrine and others to take the life and uh, uh, be content to talk to each other perhaps over the fence uh, on occasion. But one of the wonderful things about the Heidelberg Catechism on the Christian life and on everything else is that piety is a seamless web of doctrine and life. Thank you very much. A seamless web of doctrine and life so that it's pious to think rightly about God. And it's not simply for the head, but also, as we've already heard, for the heart. So who, is, who is God? What has God accomplished from the Father, in the Son, by the Spirit, for us, and for our redemption? Uh, how does that come to us, as we'll hear about later uh, in discussion of the means of grace? And what are we looking forward to? All of that is part of piety. Everything in the Apostles' Creed that is part of the exposition of the Heidelberg Catechism, one of the concerns of the Heidelberg Catechism is to cover the Apostles' Creed. Everything in the Apostles' Creed is piety. Everything in there is about the, the wonderful faith uh, that we are anchored in and that wonderful faith that we are driven toward. Actually, one of the key questions on the Christian life in the Heidelberg Catechism comes in the middle of the grace section. Not even in the third section. Or it's day 12, question 32. But why are you called a Christian? Because by faith I am a member of Christ, and so I share in his anointing. I'm anointed to confess his name, to present myself to him as a living sacrifice of thanks, to strive with a good conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and afterward to reign with Christ over all creation for all eternity. Isn't that marvelous? That'll preach. That is a succinct statement of the Christian life, and it comes right smack dab in the middle of section two, not section three of the Catechism. And so the Catechism is always talking about the Christian life. It's not just in section three, but it's throughout the Catechism. That's the point I'm, I want to make here in the introduction. It's always talking about the Christian life. But whenever it's talking about the Christian life, it's also talking about the gospel. And whenever it's talking about the gospel, it's also talking about the God who gave the gospel. The God whose promises are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And it's always talking about the need, if not directly, at least presupposing the need that we have because of our misery. So now, with that background, we turn to uh, the third section of gratitude, and I'd just like to walk us uh, through some of the highlights here briefly. I'm not going to go into every question, but just hit some of the highlights. You have an outline on your chair if you want to uh, follow along. <clears throat> Ever since the Apostle Paul, uh, critics of the doctrine of justification by grace alone through faith alone have said that it will lead to license. I'm sure you've heard it before, uh, not only in Roman Catholic circles, but in Protestant circles. You uh, often hear it said that if you, well, if you, if you preach 
Justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. All of your righteousness is alien, is imputed to you. You're not partly justified by a righteousness that is imputed and partly justified by a righteousness that is inherent. Or if you preach that faith is simply a clinging to Christ, resting in Jesus Christ. But that faith itself, uh, uh, in the act of justifying, is also working by love. If you, if, if you, if you, if you deny that, and you, you affirm imputation by grace alone, through faith, which is a resting alone in Christ alone, if you really preach that, it will lead to chaos. It will lead to license in the church. I mean, after all, uh, I, I like to sin. God likes to forgive. That's a perfect relationship. Isn't that what justification by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone actually means? And it's not just uh, Luther who first was asked that question, but the Apostle Paul. Paul anticipated, because he had already heard, as uh, we, we notice uh, a couple places in uh, Paul's writings where he says that people were actually accusing him of preaching, uh, let's go set our daylights out so that we can have more grace. And so now he's coming to the place where he's asking the question that his preaching in the first five chapters of Romans would have provoked. Should we then sin as a result of everything I've said here about misery and grace, guilt and grace? Should we then sin that grace may abound? Heaven forbid. Now, there are two ways you can go there with, after the heaven forbid when you're giving your rationale for that very strong no. You can, uh, you can either say, on one hand, no, because if you do, you'll lose your salvation. Or you can do what Paul did and say, no, don't you realize the gospel is bigger than justification? It's not only that we're justified, it's also that we are renewed. We are united to Christ both for deliverance from the condemnation and guilt of our sin and the tyranny of our sin. And those are two acts of faith. One act of faith clings to one Christ who cannot be divided, and he is the source of our justification and our sanctification. Sorry, if, if you're an antinomian, you don't believe the gospel enough. It's not that you need a, more law is that you don't really believe enough of the gospel. Because the gospel proclaims release of captives, not only from the guilt, but also the tyranny of sin. And that's exactly the course that the catechism takes. It recognizes, as Paul did, as Martin Lloyd-Jones points out in his commentary on this verse, if you haven't, if you haven't heard after preaching Romans 1 through 5, Or just preaching a simple gospel message. If you haven't heard the criticism that your message will lead to license, you haven't preached the gospel yet. And it did for Paul. And it will do for us. Got to stop qualifying the death. The death of the uh, the gospel. The death of the gospel by a thousand qualifications. Well, but that doesn't mean that... No, preach the gospel in all of its fullness, and then when the question comes up, and it will... Answer it the way Paul did. And that's exactly what the Heidelberg Catechism does. In Lord's Day 24, question 64. But doesn't this teaching of justification make people indifferent and wicked? Which, of course, was an interesting indictment given the state of the medieval church. Uh, It's kind of a a difficult... uh, uh, case to make that the reformers were uh, living a wicked and corrupt life in comparison with the medieval church. Nevertheless, that was the, that was the assumption. But the catechism replies, just as Paul did, no, it is impossible for those drafted into Christ by true faith not to produce fruits of gratitude. <laughs> you see why that's gospel? There are no ifs, ands, or buts there. 
It is impossible for those who are engrafted into Christ by true faith not to produce fruits of gratitude. I don't know about you, but that's wonderfully comforting to me. Because I, I, I tend to be the, the kind of uh, person who uh, is just looking for a good road map. Uh, you don't have, many of you won't recognize this phrase, but some of you will. In, in the States, we have this, this uh, uh, slogan, get her done. Just do it. You may have seen the Nike slogan, just do it. My wife thinks that that is my family crest, the slogan on my family crest. Everyone in my family is like this. Just, you know, we'll think about it later, but right now let's just do it. And that's sort of an American characteristic, I realize. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pick up the pieces later, <laughs> but for right now let's just do it. And, and that is not the way the catechism approaches this question. The catechism realizes the more we understand the gospel, the more deeply we grow into the gospel, not move on from the gospel into the Christian life, but move deeper into the gospel for the resources we need in the Christian life, the more our motivation, the more our direction, the more our, the longevity of our Christian faith will be fueled for the long haul. There are all sorts of challenges, of course, to question 64. Not only uh, in our lives, but also in the polemics of our day as in every period. Uh, not only does Rome still, con con still give the uh, rejoinder to justification that it will lead to license, but we hear it on many hands in evangelical circles as well. Martin Luther said that it's sort of like a, 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 a drunk guy getting up on a horse. He falls off on one side and gets back up and then falls off on the other side. And he said that in the context of the antinomian controversy where people uh, were rising up even in his own circle, even some of his own friends who were saying, good works are positively injurious to our salvation. <laughs> if they're not... If, if we're not justified by works, then they're, they're, they're perfectly injurious to, to our salvation. And Luther thundered with uh, two treatises against these people. One of his good friends was, was one of the leaders of it. He actually sued Luther. Uh, and uh, uh, Luther wrote another treatise in typical Luther fashion. It's what you do when you sue Luther. He'll write another one. And uh, he won that controversy came up again in Lutheran circles in the Book of Concord, enshrined the third use of the law primarily as a way of putting down that antinomian threat. And so the Reformed churches were, in some ways, beneficiaries of those debates in wider evangelical circles during the Reformation. But it's true, there's a, there's a tendency for us to, when we rediscover the gospel, or discover it even for the first time, perhaps even been raised in the church, discover it for the first time, it's a tendency to fall off on one side and then get back on the horse and fall off on the other. And so we're often driven between these extremes of legalism and license. The Catechism first gives us four reasons for good works. Four reasons for good works. I was raised in American fundamentalism. We weren't given a lot of reasons for good works. We were given a lot of rules for good works, but we weren't, and they weren't always biblical, but we were given very little rationale, you know, the sort that Paul gives in Romans 12, in view of God's mercies. What mercies? The mercies I've been talking about for 11 chapters. In view of God's mercies, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is now your reasonable, logical Service. It makes sense now for you to live this way and not this way because of all the mercies that I've been unpacking. And so the Heidelberg Catechism, again, following Christ and the Apostles, gives us reasons for good works. First of all, union with Christ. It includes the sanctifying work of the Spirit. 
Uh, it, it, the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a down payment. It, it, uh, he, he not only uh, empowers prophets, He not only indwells a temple made of physical stones, but He now inhabits every believer and the church collectively in these latter days. And He is the down payment on our final redemption, the resurrection of our body. And so, sanctifying grace is included, along with justifying grace, in this union with Christ. Second, gratitude for His redemption. And third, to encourage our assurance. And then the fourth reason that the Catechism gives is to win our neighbors to Christ. It's interesting, isn't it, that the Heidelberg Catechism was written in a context of a Landeskirche. I probably butchered that pronunciation. In the context of a, of a state religion. And so, why would you want to win your friends to Christ? Because from its inception, Reformed faith has been evangelistic. Not just evangelical in its substance, but evangelistic in its concern to preach the gospel, proclaim it, as, as we heard wonderfully last night uh, concerning the uh, uh, introduction from Frederick III to the Catechism. Uh, even, even the elector himself was concerned for the evangelization of the people under his care. Some people say, well, assurance is not the only reason Scripture gives as a motivation for good works. And of course that's true. Of course there are many passages you can find in Scripture that uh, uh, call you to obedience uh, for a whole host of reasons, but uh, I submit that the Catechism is exactly right and fair in bringing all of these sub-motives under the category of gratitude because what gratitude as a category captures is that the imperatives are always grounded in the indicatives. What God calls us to do is always rooted in what He has already accomplished for us. That we're, we're never given an imperative so that we can ful ful fulfill something that will lead somehow to God's acceptance of us and to our union with Christ. For Rome, the beatific vision, ultimate union with God, is something that one hoped for, but in the Heidelberg Catechism, indeed in Scripture, union with Christ is what we live out of. It's not what we live for, it's what we live out of with glorification being the certain future aspect of this assurance. Uh, we, we'll, we'll be hearing uh, later from uh, Dr. Beakey, who has written an entire book on this, I highly recommend, uh, on assurance. Uh, I think that, that uh, we, we could spend a lot of time on uh, question 21, I won't spend a lot of time on it. I'll just uh, mention it briefly here because uh, I think this is an issue that is of interesting comparison with the Westminster Standards. It, in the Heidelberg Catechism, faith is assurance. True faith, we read, is not only a knowledge and conviction that everything God reveals in His Word is true. That would just be historical faith. It's not just believing the Bible and everything in it. It is also a deep-rooted assurance created in me by the Holy Spirit through the Gospel that out of sheer grace earned for us in Christ not only others, but I too have had my sins forgiven and have been made right forever with God and have been granted salvation. Every clause is just pure gold. The deep rooted assurance. But if it just stopped there, then I would be looking for that deep rooted assurance. 
Sure, you may have assurance, but do you have the deep-rooted assurance? How deeply rooted is your assurance? Someone asked Augustine what time was, and he said, I don't know, I knew before you asked. <laughs> you know, it's like, what is love? Uh, well, I, I yeah, I, I knew before you asked me. I don't know how to define, it's so hard to define the things that we work with all the time as the most basic stuff of our lives, and the same is true of assurance. But I knew I was assured until you asked me if, if I had assurance, <laughs> you know, uh, it doesn't stop there. Wonderfully, it says, created by the Holy Spirit. The word and the sacraments do not create faith or assurance. The Holy Spirit does this. But the Holy Spirit does it through the Holy Gospel. And, and therefore, we have to hear the Gospel even as Christians. Heidelberg Catechism does not leave the gospel in section 2, in part 2, under grace. It brings it right into gratitude. It's a deep-rooted assurance created in me by the Holy Spirit through the gospel that out of sheer grace earned for us in Christ, not only others, but I too have had my sins forgiven, have been made right, uh, forever right with God, and have been granted salvation. There's an, an objective emphasis here that is so important for us to recover in our day. Faith and assurance are not distinguished in the Heidelberg Catechism. To, to believe in Christ is to be assured. To believe his promise, to cling to his promise, is to be assured. We could talk about later and I uh, assume that my, uh, my better Dr. Bakey on this is going to bring some of these uh, issues out uh, later. My own uh, view on this is that sometimes we make more out of the difference between the Heidelberg Catechism and the Westminster Standards than is actually there. Uh, we're talking more about uh, differences in formulation over a generation rather than differences in formulation between traditions. Uh, but... Uh, I do think this is an important point that the Catechism makes, and I still do agree with it that although assurance can be encouraged, as the Catechism goes on to say, can be encouraged and strengthened by our, our good works, it is not the basis. And that, that's, a, that's exactly the position that Calvin taught in the Institutes, that, that uh, good works can serve as secondary evidences, but never as primary bases of our assurance. I think that's what the Catechism is pointing out here when it reminds us uh, that it also assures you. One of the reasons for doing good works is also to encourage our, our assurance. Besides the word and baptism, the Lord's <laughs> Supper not only reminds us, but Lord's Day 75 tells us, assures you that you share in Christ's one sacrifice on the cross and in all his gifts. And so, like baptism, like the Lord's Supper, the fruit uh, of our, our uh, uh, faith can be evidenced in good works that encourage us and refresh us and direct us uh, always back to the root of that assurance, which is Christ himself. Questions 87 through 90 touch on repentance, which is broken down uh, into the classical categories of uh, repentance and faith. Conversion in Reformed theology is usually distinguished uh, into two groups, into, into two uh, uh, aspects. Repentance and faith, this does not necessarily mean two different stages uh, separated by years, <laughs> but rather two different aspects of the same uh, uh, instance of conversion. And that although this is definitive, it's also progressive. Daily we die and rise. Daily we are putting to death the deeds of the flesh. <laughs> Just as conversion consists of two parts, repentance and faith, repentance 
the Catechism reminds us, consists of two parts, mortification and vivification. In other words, dying and rising. And this mortification consists of three parts, sorrow, hatred, and flight. Now, sometimes we're accused of being uh, logic choppers. Boy, we, we just love outlines, you know. And then this is broken down into two, and then they tell two friends, and then they tell two friends, and on and on it goes. Uh, it looks like a circuit board. If you've ever seen Thomas, uh, or if you've ever seen uh, William Perkins' uh, uh, chart, uh, you know it's easy to make fun of that without without actually explaining what he's doing there. But the the first time you see it, you think it's he's an engineer. He's not a theologian. He's an engineer. We just you know, love making these distinctions. But distinctions can be very helpful, and certainly these distinctions. Uh, I think, are not only helpful, but are, are grounded in Scripture. Ever heard people try to define repentance from the hip? This sort of, uh, uh, you know, coming up with it all by themselves without any reflection on what other people have said. <clears throat> terrifying. I've heard some terrifying definitions of repentance. Th- these are great. Repentance involves mortification, which is sorrow, hatred, and flight. If we had more time, we could contrast these with the Roman Catholic pe- uh, sacrament of penance. Uh, wow, what a difference we find here. And then vivification, which the Catechism defines as joy in God through Christ and a delight to do every kind of good as God wants us to do. Once again, uh, as uh, Dr. Beeky was pointing out last night, how could, how could anyone say that catechism isn't God-centered? Joy in God through Christ, enjoying God forever, and the light to do every kind of good as God wants us to do. That's vivification. So conversion involves these two parts, repentance and faith, and repentance involves mortification and vivification. And then the catechism defines good works. First of all, good works have to arise from faith. Faith has to be the source. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, to the writer of the Hebrews. People can do all sorts of virtuous things without being Christians. Virtuous? No, we believe in total depravity. Well, we don't believe that that means that everybody is as bad as he could possibly be. Before God, uh, there is no one who does good. No, not even one. But before each other, of course there are ranks. We wouldn't have jails. uh, And we wouldn't have awards ceremonies. Nobel Peace Prizes. And everything in between, if there, there weren't different rankings before fellow human beings when it came to virtue. Uh... But that's not good works. A good work is not simply doing something that is good before human beings. A good work, first of all, has to be the fruit of faith. It has to come from faith in Christ. Secondly, the norm has to be God's law. The source has to be faith, and the norm has to be God's law. When I first got married, I uh, did all sorts of things wrong. I'm so glad I don't do it anymore. Uh, Everything I do is just perfect. Uh, It's wonderful not having my wife on these trips. Uh, And uh, (laughs) counter counter evidence. See, Joel can't do that because Mary's here. And uh, (laughs) if uh, I said things like that, my wife would uh, be able to give counter evidence. But it was a little worse, I think she would at least let me say. A little worse at the, at the beginning. Because I wanted to give her presents that I was sure she would love. So for Christmas or her birthday, uh, I, I, would, I really enjoyed picking out what I delighted in getting her. And then at some point, she suggested that I might consult her. <laughs> And maybe 
discern what it is that she actually took pleasure in. And yet it's very easy. We love to be creative. No, I'm not going to follow the recipe. I'm not going to follow it. Okay, I guess maybe I'm the only type of person who does it. I'm not going to follow what she wants me to give her. I'm not going to follow the recipe. No, I want, I want to make this my way. And everyone will love it because it's mine. And she will love this gift because it's my gift that I picked out for her. And we do that with God, right? We just say, oh, I know he'll love it. He'll love my creativity. He'll love my ingenuity. I think I'm, I think I'm going to get a surprise for this under my pillow. But that's not what God is pleased with. What God is pleased with is what conforms to his law. Law tells us what God loves. God, the law tells us what God delights in. Whatever arises from faith, whatever conforms to God's law, and then whatever is done for God's glory. The source has to be faith. The norm has to be God's law. And the aim has to be God's glory. Notice how it carefully distinguishes things without separating them. That's the greatest danger in theology and in the Christian life. To distinguish things carefully without separating them. He doesn't confu- the, the catechism doesn't confuse the, the, the ground of good works, or I should say the motive for good works. He doesn't confuse faith with the law, the law of the gospel. He doesn't confuse those, but he also doesn't separate them. In every good work, you have it arising from faith, not arising from fear, not arising from uh, uh, the fear of punishment and hope of rewards, but arising from faith, from confidence, that assurance that comes to us from the Holy Spirit through the gospel. It conforms to God's law and is done for God's glory. So the law is never the law is never the the uh, uh, the, the source, but it is always the norm. I think of it as a sailboat. You know, there's got to be wind in the sails, and that's the gospel. And then there have, you have to have instruments uh, in, in the boat to tell you where you're going and where you need to be. And, and that's why we need both the law and the gospel in the Christian life. Well, then what conforms to God's law? Well, there's the natural place to give the exposition of the Ten Commandments. Uh, as we've heard, the purpose of a catechism was, was basically to teach uh, people, especially the young, the Lord's, the, the, the uh, uh, Apostles' Creed, the Ten Commandments, and the Lord's Prayer. So it's not really guilt, grace, and gratitude that are the overarching uh, uh, ways of dividing the catechism, but these three important summaries of the Christian faith that all Christians hold, which is why it's such a Catholic catechism. I quibble with, with uh, some of my uh, friends from time to time over Reformed faith. I mean, just for fun, it's not a, this is not a big deal at all. But I don't, I don't use the term Reformed faith. Uh, I, I refer to it as the Christian faith and its Reformed confession. The Reformed confession, the Heidelberg Catechism is the Reformed confession of the Christian faith. It is not a confession of the Reformed faith because there is no Reformed faith. There is only a Christian faith that the Reformed believe is most clearly and faithfully articulated in its standards. And so the Catechism turns to the exposition of the Ten Commandments. Uh, first, first, a comment about placement here. Um, it, even, even before I came out here, I uh, noticed uh, a comment that is pretty characteristic of something that I hear uh, in Reformed circles these days, that uh, the Heidelberg Catechism placed the exposition of the law under the third section 
because it highlights the importance of the third use of the law, whereas Luther's small catechism uh, and large catechism place it in the beginning because they emphasize the first use of the law to drive us to Christ. Let me say just a brief word about that um, because I, I, think that, I think that it's not quite accurate uh, historically. First of all, there is a place at the very beginning where the Heidelberg Catechism treats the law in its first use. Uh, right out of the gate, so, you know, what, what three things do you have to know? <laughs> Already setting the stage for the way the catechism will be divided into, into the three parts. You have to know the law, which drives you to Christ. You need to know the gospel, in which we have a saving union with Christ. And then you need to know how the law guides you and the gospel motivates you in the Christian life. You need to know these three things. Question three, how do you know your misery? From the law of God. Well, that's the first use of the law. Question four, what does the law require? Then he gives the summary, Jesus' summary of the law. And can you keep this law perfectly? No, in fact, I'm inclined to hate God in my neighbor. You can't get a stronger affirmation of the clear distinction between the law and the gospel and the law in its first use to drive us to Christ than you do at the very beginning of the Heidelberg Catechism, just as you do in Luther's small, small and large catechism. Uh, furthermore, the, uh, early on with Luther, there wasn't this division into three uses of the law. So Luther very often talks about the third use of the law under the first use and, and vice versa. In his large and small catechism, it's all third use. He's talking to Christians. But he will talk to Christians about the law leading them to Christ, as he will also talk about the law directing people in what they should be doing, including Christians. Never, never in, the, in Luther's catechisms does he talk about the law as something that Christians are now free of, especially in the antinomian controversies, uh, that option was off the table. You could not, you could not be an evangelical and hold that believers were no longer obliged to the law. Well, then where did the third use come from? Well, as, as has been pretty, uh, uh, to my mind, at least conclusively shown, the third use of the law uh, as a standard division, something that was taught in uh, in systems of theology came from Melanchthon. Two years before Melanchthon, uh, two years after Melanchthon published his Loci Communis, where he talked about the third use of the law, Calvin articulated it, uh, as far as I can find, for the first time in his Romans commentary. And Calvin, as we know, was very good friends with and co colleague with uh, Philip Melanchthon. Uh, so here they were, both at a stage in the Reformation where you're trying to refine and put distinctions together. Luther said, I chopped down the forest and Melanchthon stacks the wood. That was very much true. And of course, Calvin was of the same generation as Melanchthon. So when people, I'm just saying this because this is, the, yet we have a tendency, at least in American Reformed circles, to chop the Reformed tradition up into 18,000 different varieties. I guess we have the luxury to do that, you know, uh, or think we have the luxury to do that uh, with so many reformed people running around, we think. Um, it helps to get out and realize that, you know, there, 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 there are more things than uh, uh, to unite around than there are things to divide us. But there are flagpoles everywhere. Everybody's got a flag. I am of Paul. I am of Paulus. I am of, you know, this part of the... This tradition, that tradition. Well, the, the, the authors of the Heidelberg Catechism had a confessional consciousness, not a party consciousness. And I think that it is important not only to understand, not, not only so we don't misrepresent our Lutheran brothers and sisters, but also so we don't overstate our tradition's difference from fellow evangelicals. To be able to, to recognize here that the third use of the law 
is something that all evangelicals held to, including Lutherans to this day. It's in the Book of Concord. My Lutheran friends say, uh, uh, we affirm the third use of the law just as strongly as you do, and we affirmed it before you did. You just like to talk about it. <laughs> I think that's pretty fair. That's a pretty fair... They're just, they, their palms get sweaty when they talk about the third use of the law. It's the only difference. Uh, the, uh, also in the Westminster Confession, chapter 19, uh, the law still drives us to Christ. So it speaks exactly the same way as, as Luther does in his catechisms about the law functioning in the Christian life to still drive us to Christ as well as to, to direct us in the Christian life. Then comes the division of the commandments into uh, what we owe God and what we owe our neighbor and what we are to shun, the negative, as well as what we are to do, the positive, with each commandment. It's one of the things that you find in the, especially the, the uh, catechisms of the Reformation, all of them do this. Uh, you not only have a negative prohibition, but you have a, a positive, uh, uh, something positive to fulfill. And this, this is because Jesus taught us, didn't he, that uh, it, 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 is, it is not simply by refraining from pulling a trigger and shooting someone, but by loving people and giving them whatever we have to sustain their lives. Uh, a radical view of what love actually is, what it means to love God and our neighbor. And the catechisms, uh, I think, so helpfully uh, point that up, certainly the Heidelberg Catechism. And I do think that the generality of the guidelines is helpful there. Uh, I, I do love the Westminster Shorter Catechism's definition of idolatry. I, I like that kind of specificity, but one, I, I do like the Heidelberg Catechism's <clears throat> generality that allows the law to be applied in concrete cases, concrete circumstances. And this is something that developed, I think, especially in our tradition, this emphasis on cases, particular cases, whole thick volumes were written by the Puritans on cases of conscience. Like, wow, boy, they were legalistic, weren't they? How could you write it? And they love to read this stuff? So here, here are the cases that I've handled in my pastoral ministry, and here's how I solved these cases. Boy, it's just legalism. No, it's the opposite of legalism. Legalism is, is going into an office where they have uh, one therapy that they learned in psychology school that applies in every case to everyone, or something they learned in an ethics class that is a universal rule that you would wish to be imposed on everyone else that you learned from Kant. Uh, that's legalism. No, they were saying, cases are so specific that you have to look around. The Bible speaks with these general principles, but they have to be applied in concrete circumstances. Divorce is wrong, but not in every case. There are exceptions. What are those exceptions? And people like William Perkins in his volume, Cases of Conscience, did not write it because he believed he had an answer for every single pastoral problem. But pastors wanted to share with each other how they were applying these essential principles to circumstantial issues that admitted a wide variety of application. It's the opposite of legalism. And I think that, that tendency for circumspection, for looking around, I love that word, circum, circuminspectio means to look around. They love to look around. Look around at the particulars of the situation. Don't just go applying things in general ways. And then finally, the Lord's Prayer. Wow. Okay, the Lord's Prayer, very, very quickly. Uh, we should just pray it. I shouldn't talk about it. Uh, the, the reason for the prayer is that it's the most important part of thankfulness that God requires of us. And two, God answers it. There's another place where it would be interesting to, to talk about maybe some differences between uh, the Heidelberg and the Westminster standards over whether prayer is a means of grace. Uh, I have my own take on that. I won't uh, burden you with it uh, right now. But it's interesting that at least the way the 
continental reform tradition has interpreted this, uh, and I think it was the intention of the Heidelberg Catechism to put it this way, it was certainly how Calvin viewed prayer, um, that prayer is the first part of gratitude. It's not part of the, uh, of the gospel. It's not a means of grace because the subject is not God, but the prayer. And, and the whole point of means of grace, it's means of God's grace coming down to us, whereas our prayers go up to God. And therefore, prayer isn't, strictly speaking, a means of grace. Prayer is a means of gratitude. And it's the first part of gratitude. It's like that, that sound that a baby makes when the doctor slaps his rear end. It's the first cry uh, of, of, of a child crying, Abba, Father. First form, first form of communication is a believer's prayer. Isn't that wonderful? It should be the last form of communication of a believer as well. And it only becomes that if it's a normal part of our lives in between. How are we to pray? Uh, how, how are we to pray? Uh, first, from the heart to the one true God who's revealed himself in his word, asking for everything he has commanded us to ask for. So, well, what has he asked for? Well, the Lord's prayer is the best trellis for that. We, we need a trellis. You know, vines, a trellis can't make a vine grow, but it can make it grow in the right direction. And that's why the Lord gives us the structure here of the Lord's Prayer. We need, we need a trellis. It can't make us pray. It can't give us the motivation to pray, but it gives us a trellis, just as the law gives us a trellis for our gratitude. What are we to pray for? That's when uh, the exposition of the Lord's Prayer itself uh, is, is laid out. I don't have time now to go through uh, each petition's absolutely marvelous the way the Lord's Prayer is unpacked in the Heidelberg Catechism in a way, once again, that orients us towards God's glorious future for us in Jesus Christ when He comes again in His kingdom. Even if we are in trials, even if we are persecuted, the Catechism says, Lord, uphold us and make us strong with the strength of your Holy Spirit so that we may not go down to defeat in the spiritual struggle but may firmly resist our enemies until we finally win the complete victory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have already achieved that victory in Jesus Christ objectively for us, that you are already passing out the uh, wonderful uh, medals and rewards of your victory, distributing the gifts of the Spirit to the saints, even giving the Holy Spirit himself as the gift. And we thank you that you will continue this work that you have begun in us to the very end until your Son does return in glory to judge the living and the dead and to bring us home forever with all the saints to enjoy that eternal Sabbath. Here is where we pray in Christ's name. Amen.